to today's House of Assembly sitting. It is the 9th of May, 2017. From the Government Information Service, I am Alicia Ali, and thank you so very much for joining us here at the National Television Network. Now, don't worry, there are several ways you can connect with us. Well, quite apart from being on our cable channels, you can connect with us on Facebook Live, you can join our YouTube channel, you can also log on to www.govt.lc so that you can catch today's exciting proceedings. What do we have on the agenda today? Well, of course, it's the appropriation bill. What does that mean? The appropriation bill. Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan M. Chastney, will be laying his first budget address in the House of Assembly since being elected on the 6th of June 2016. And in that presentation, we are expecting the Prime Minister to present a roadmap for the country. And it will focus on the implementation of programs, projects, and policies. And the title of that presentation will be Build a New St. Lucia. The Prime Minister will specifically lay out plans for strategic priority areas, not only for this year, but over the next three to four years. And in those strategic areas that we are looking at, we're looking at creating sustainable employment, social re-engineering, tourism, agriculture, security and justice, energy and climate change. Now, if we go down to the chamber floor, we can see we have quite a number of people here in the audience waiting to take in the proceedings, uh, quite apart from the members on the floor who are elected members of parliament. We see the opposition and the government side present and um, deep that we see on the government side, uh, we can see the um, minister in the Ministry of Finance along with the minister in the Ministry of Agriculture. They are actually senators and the upper house will be meeting on the appropriation bill, not this week, but subsequently. Well, first and foremost, the prime minister will lay the bill here today and the debate will continue from 4 p.m. tomorrow and will move into Thursday and maybe Friday. And we can see the President of the Senate, Honorable Andy Daniels, also here to take in the proceedings. We have officials from the Ministry of Finance who will be assisting the Prime Minister in his budget address. As we look around the chamber, uh, while we are waiting for the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Leon Theodore John, we can see that uh, there are... Uh, the, the atmosphere is quite exciting, actually. Um, and while we're, we're on the subject of appropriation bill, which what it does when the appropriation bill moves to become the Appropriations Act, it allows the government of St. Lucia to withdraw money from the consolidated fund. We can see the public gallery here at the House of Parliament in Labour Street, uh, in Cass Street. And, it, and it's, it's, there's a few more seats left, uh, but as you can see, everybody is shoulder to shoulder here in the gallery anxiously awaiting uh, the Prime Minister's maiden address on the appropriation bill. Now going back to the appropriation bill, uh, before we met uh, last, not last week, but the week before, where the Prime Minister presented the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the upcoming fiscal year 2017 to 2018 in the amount of $1.513 billion. And Today, he's expected to expound on the figures in that document, the dollars and cents on the constituencies, the different government agencies and ministries, and he will also be expected to outline the medium to long term fiscal strategies, including um, a number of tax reforms. We are expecting the Speaker of the House of Assembly of St. Lucia, the Honorable Leon Theodore John, and she will be coming into the chamber very shortly. Um, and so just very briefly before she enters the chamber, we can, in, according to the Prime Minister's um, budget address that we were able to take in previously, um, the target of 3.2% oh, of GDP in the budget um, was met and there was a marked improvement in the fiscal position of central government and uh, we can see that 
for revenues and grants, tax revenue recorded $13.1 million in surplus over its target of $945.7 billion. The sergeant of arms is making his way into the chamber. He's carrying the mace and he is followed by the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Leon Theodore John. And this signals the beginning of this afternoon's proceedings. I now take you to the chamber floor. Let us pray. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we thine unworthy servants here gathered together in thy name do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultations. And grant that we, having thy fear, always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsel may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public will, peace, and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same. In true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Announcements. <laughs> Honorable members, I wish to inform that I am in receipt of communications from the Honorable Member for Denry South, indicating that he is unable to be with us today and therefore sends these apologies. Statements by ministers. Papers to be laid. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, the Public Service, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 37 of 2017, Public Service Commission, Disciplinary Proceedings Regulations. Honorable Member for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following paper standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 38 of 2017, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, Larry Shoes Viewford Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 39 of 2017, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, Larry Shoes Viewford Vesting Order Number 2. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism and information and broadcasting. Madam Speaker, I would like to lay the following papers in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 40 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Nico Storing Services Limited, Order. 
statutory instrument number 41 of uh, 2017, Tourism Incentives, Black Pearl Limited Order, statutory instrument number 42 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and, in and Investment, Cabot St. Lucia, Inc. Order, statutory instrument number 43 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, the Hamlet Limited Order, Statutory Instrument Number 44 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Be Wretched Limited Order, Statutory Instrument Number 45 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Freedom Fund Inc. Order, Statutory Instrument Number 46 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Flora Cottages, Villas Limited Order. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for commerce, industry, enterprise development, and consumer affairs. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following paper standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 47 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 6, Order. Bills. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, the Public Service Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the first reading a bill shortly entitled Appropriation 2017 2018. Appropriation 2017 2018. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, the Public Service Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of Standing Order 48-2 to allow the appropriation 2017-2018 bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable members, the question is that Standing Order 48-2 be suspended in order to allow the appropriation 2017-2018 bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. I now put the question. As many are as of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many are as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Leave is granted, Honorable Prime Minister. Honorable Minister in the Office of the in the minist, mini, Office of the Prime Minister for, Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for external affairs. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of Standing Order 329 in order to allow the Honorable Prime Minister for Finance and Minister for, for Finance to move the second reading of the Appropriation 2017-2018 Bill beyond the stipulated time and without interruption. Honorable members, the question is that Standing Order 39-329 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Minister for Finance to move for the second reading of the appropriation 2017-2018 bill beyond the stipulated time and without interruption. I now put the question, as many are as of that opinion say aye. aye, as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Leave is granted. Please proceed, Honorable Prime Minister. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the public service leader of government business.
Madam Speaker, I beg to move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled Appropriation 2017-2018 Bill. Madam Speaker, I'm extremely honored today to deliver the policy statement on the budget for fiscal year 2017-2018 to this Honorable House. This is also a very special occasion for me as I am for the first time presenting a budget address to this Honorable House. I feel extremely humble, Madam Speaker, and I wish to place on record my thanks and appreciation to the many people of St. Lucia, especially the people of Miku South. Many are who are, who are here today. I want to recognize Wendy, Kennison, Anthony, Joseph, Nicole, Philip, Etienne, Teresa, Lorena, Valencia, Anthony with his tie, Morris and Mary. These are only a few of the people who I owe a great debt of gratitude for their confidence and continued support. Madam Speaker, I wish to inform the people of St. Lucia that our government will not let them down. This is why we began to work on the day after elections. We're confident that with the help of the people of St. Lucia, we will rescue our economy. Madam Speaker, our government has been in office for a little over 11 months and now have a full appreciation of the state of the economy and the public finances. I must say, the situation confronting St. Lucia is far worse than we thought it was. Madam Speaker, the dashboard of economic and social indicators for St. Lucia shows we are trapped in a vicious cycle characterized by low growth, high unemployment, and high debt this malaise has brought untold suffering on the people of St. Lucia. We intend, with the help of the people of St. Lucia, to turn this economy around. Madam Speaker, much has been written about the state of St. Lucia's economy, and I believe we all know the problems very well. The myriad of reports written by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, essentially highlight the same set of issues and challenges, challenges faced by this economy. These include low growth, high public debt and fiscal deficits, high unemployment, low productivity, lack of competitiveness, structural problems in the labor market, and the high cost of doing business. Madam Speaker, these issues have been discussed ad nauseum, yet the problems still remain. We are determined to lift St. Lucia out of this economic quagmire by taking the necessary tough policy decisions required to lead us back into a trajectory of high growth, sustainable debt, high levels of investment, low unemployment, and improved standard of living for all St. Lucians. Madam Speaker, I've listened to many St. Lucians of all walks of life, and I personally feel inspired by them. I know that they are willing to partner with us in making the changes required to make St. Lucia a prosperous economy. We will not, Madam Speaker, achieve instant success. Rome, after all, was not built in a day. This, bu this budget will lay the foundation for the implementation of the programs, projects and policies which my government intends to implement over the next four years to make St. Lucia the success story of the Caribbean. In this policy I address, Madam Speaker, I shall outline the context, the vision, the plan, programs and policies that we intend to implement, which will be the foundation for the next four years. The road to our destination will be bumpy. Implementing change is sometimes messy and, I never, and never easy. I am, however, confident in the people of St. Lucia 
they understand that we will have to choose a different path as the greatest risk is continuing to do the same thing. My government will provide honest, effective and inspirational leadership to tackle the economic and social policy challenges in an, inequi in, in an, an equitable manner. Madam Speaker, following the severe impact of the financial crisis, global economic growth has settled at a moderate rate of about 3%. The IMF is projecting that the U.S. economy, economic growth will accelerate to about 2.3% in 2017 and 2.5% and in 2018, while the euro area is projected to grow by 1.7% in 2017 and 1.6% 1 in 2018. Commodity prices have remained low, particularly energy prices, and this has contributed to the low levels of inflation in most countries. Crude oil prices have remained below US $50 per barrel on average in 2016. This average remains significantly below its peak in 2008 when the average was $99.06 per barrel. Indications suggest a slight increase in inflation in, inflation in 2017, particularly in advanced economies as interest rates are expected to increase. Madam Speaker, the economies of most Caribbean countries showed signs of strengthening in 2016, with the exception of Trinidad and Tobago. However, constraints to growth namely high debt levels and external current and fiscal deficits, remain. The main drivers of growth were tourism and construction activity. The tourism-dependent countries such as Barbados, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and the members of the Eastern Caribbean currency experienced increased arrivals, mainly from the United States. The economies of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, Union averaged a growth rate of 2.2%, while St. Lucia's economy grew only 0.9%, from 1.9% in 2015. The fiscal position of the governments of some countries improved markedly, most notably in Grenada, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis. <coughs> Madam Speaker, St. Lucia's 0.9% growth performance in 2016, though meager, was attributed to expansions in its construction, manufacturing, agriculture, wholesale and retail and financial services sector. Over the past 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, the overall economy has been growing at an average rate of 1.3%. St. Lucia's economy continued to experience deflation in 2016, with the consumer price index falling by 3.1%. This was mainly due to lower energy prices. The country's major trading partners experienced negative to low inflation, which also contributed to the lower cons consumer prices in St. Lucia. The increase in domestic economic activity was accompanied by an improvement in the labor force participation rate, which increased to 73.4%, and a further reduction in the rate of unemployment. There was a reduction in the unemployment rate from 24.1% in 2015 to 21.6% in 2016. While this is good news, there are still about 22,500 people unemployed in this country and a youth unemployment rate of 43.1%, which is a serious matter that my government is already tackling head on. The fiscal operations of the central government improved in fiscal year 2016-2017 as evidenced by the narrowing of the fiscal deficit which moved from 100.9 million in 2015-2016 to 67.8 million in 2016-2017. This was mainly due to a higher growth in revenue and moderate growth in expenditure. Total revenue and grants receipts increased by 6% while total expenditure increased by 3%. The growth in current expenditure was driven by double-digit increases in interest payments and current transfers. 
The tourism sector continued to dominate economic activity despite declining numbers in 2016. Total visitor arrivals fell by 7.3%, mainly due to a 13.2% decline in cruise arrivals. The drop in cruise passengers was partly offset by the increase of 0.9% in stayover visitors, primarily from the US and the Caribbean. Unfortunately, visitor expenditure contracted by 4.8% to 1.97 billion. The agricultural sector grew by 4%. The sector was poised to make an even greater contribution, but its performance was impacted by trop Tropical Storm Matthew in September of 2016. Banana exports were poised to record a second consecutive year of growth, with the volume of exports increasing by 15%. Up to the third quarter, however, production declined in the fourth quarter as a result of the storm resulting in an overall contraction in volume of 1.1% to 14,629 tons. Export earnings were reduced by 11.2% to 19.8 million. The pattern of banana exports appears to be shifting with the volume of export to the Caribbean region, surpassing exports to the UK for the first time. Purchases of other fruits and vegetables by supermarkets and hotels declined due to the effects of the storm. Madam Speaker, the construction sector was the most dynamic sector as a result of investment in the construction of hotels and commercial properties, accounting for approximately 60% of the growth in GDP. In 2016, work on the 450-room Royalton Hotel provided a significant boost to construction sector. Activity in the construction sector employed 17% of the 5,248 persons who gained employment in 2016. The manufacturing sector experienced further growth in 2016, evidenced by a 7.2% increase in production. Increases were recorded from non-alcoholic beverages as well as bakery products. A lack of competitiveness and low levels of utilization of productive capacity did dampen the growth prospects for the manufacturing sector. Exports of manufactured products to the region were affected by continued difficulties in Trinidad and Tobago in accessing foreign exchange. Madam Speaker, I now turn to the financial and monetary sectors. This includes the activities of banks, credit unions, insurance, and money service entities. In the commercial banking sector, the stock of bank credit and loans and advances by banks continued to fall in, 2000, in 2016, indicative of a higher level of risk aversion and arguably low growth environment resulting in reduced number of bankable projects. This decline is happening within the context of continued growth in deposits which has resulted in liquidity indications such as the loans to deposit ratios declining to 90.1% by 2016 from 119% in 2013. And excess reserves held at the ECC by the commercial banks rising to 451.1 million from 244.3 million in 2013. The liquidity of the financial sector now presents the opportunity for increased lending by banks. Madam Speaker, following the 2008 global financial crisis, there were a series of global initiatives dealing with mitigating tax avoidance and evasion and enhancing the transparency of the global financial system. These resulted in St. Lucia having to amend its financial regulatory framework so as to be compliant with the new international norms. Permit me then, Madam Speaker, to highlight a few topical developments in this vein. De-risking, Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, or we, known as FACTA, and exchange of information. Madam Speaker, according to the World Bank, de-risking refers to the severing of a correspondent banking relationship between local banks and overseas banks. Practices by global financial institutions threaten to cut off access to the global financial systems for the remittance companies and local banks in certain regions 
putting them at risk of losing access to the global financial system. If the current trend continues, people and organizations in the more volatile areas in the world or in small countries with limited financial markets, such as St. Lucia, could be completely cut off from access to regulated financial services. Keeping individuals and businesses in regulated financial systems is a precondition for effective systems to mitigate risk and combat financial crimes. In layman's terms, Madam Speaker, remittances has the ability of making you unable to use your local credit card when you travel. And what the world is saying, it does not want people to carry cash. It wants people to put their monies in banks and to deal electronically. And this is in order to strengthen the financial system and to avoid people who are trying to bypass the regulations. In March 2010, the United States enacted FACTA in a direct effort to stop tax evasion and enhance financial oversight. To become a compliant, St. Lucia signed on to the Intergovernmental Agreement Model 1A with the United States on November 19, 2015 in order to facilitate information exchanges. This allows for the two-way automatic exchange of the information between the U.S. and St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, in addition to our obligations to the United States in relation to facto, St. Lucia is party to 32 active exchange of information agreements with various countries which is spearheaded by the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for tax purposes. Madam Speaker, allow me for a moment to take a step back and reflect on St. Lucia today, or what I hope will be the St. Lucia of the past. What do I see? I see high unemployment, high debt, and chronically low growth of development. These have been the hallmark of our economy for some time. Let me now spend some time to go over some of the data to illustrate our economic and social plight. From 1996 to 2015, the economy grew by an average rate of only 1.6%. More significantly, growth averaged only 1.3% over the last 10 years. And what, is of what, and what is of great concern to this government, Madam Speaker, is the fact that the economy grew by an average of 0.3% over the last five years. Madam Speaker, low economic growth is the number one economic challenge we face in St. Lucia today. It is clear from the numbers that I have quoted that growth has become progressively weaker in more recent periods. While one may argue that the economy was severely impacted by the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, several of our regional peers have successfully recovered and are now doing better than us with their economic growth growing at higher rates. For example, growth in the ECCU from 2012 to 2016 was estimated at 2% compared to 0.3% for St. Lucia over the same period. This is just not acceptable. Over the past decade, our unemployment rate has increased significantly from 14% in 2007 to above 20% where it has stubbornly remained. Youth unemployment has followed a similar trend and has remained extremely high at 43.1%. It is an extremely sad reality that over one-fifth or 20% of our productive labor force is unemployed. And by extension, Madam Speaker, this implies unemployed capital in that scenario. This, in effect, means that we have substantial capacity for expansion, growth, and development. Another major concern we have to address in our economy is the issue of productivity. It's estimated that St. Lucia's productivity has been falling by an average of 0.6% from 2007 to 2016. The low levels of worker productivity can be directly linked to an acute skills mismatch in St. Lucia. 
Our workforce is predominantly low skills and has been revealed by many and has been revealed by many reports. However, the economy requires an ample supply of skilled and semi-skilled labor, which we are failing to produce. I believe it is worrying to know that jobs are available within the economy, but our, our citizens are not sufficiently skilled to hold these jobs. Our debt position has continued to worsen, with the debt burden creeping up from one year to the next year. The increase in the debt stock coupled with low growth and its implications for servicing the debt has severely restricted our degrees of freedom in implementing expansionary fiscal policies to cushion the adverse impact of low growth. In addition, the structure of our debt, with a large percentage of it being in the form of short-term instruments, has significantly increased the rollover risk. I would like to highlight, Madam Speaker, that the cost of doing business in St. Lucia is in most cases higher than that of its competitors. One area where the disparity is quite clear is, that, is with the cost of electricity, which in most cases directly impacts the cost of production. St. Lucia's ranking in the ease of doing business report has fallen from 34 in 2008 to 86 in 2016. This, Madam Speaker, tells us clearly that St. Lucia's trajectory is in the wrong direction and the trend must be reversed. I wish to finally mention a critical element of the enabling environment that is essential for the supporting growth and investment of physical infrastructure. Madam Speaker, we have an aging infrastructure and public assets have deteriorated significantly due to the lack of timely, adequate, and at times, no maintenance. Our roads, schools, hospitals, water distribution network, government buildings, including police stations, require urgent attention. These costs are, however, beyond what this country, country's fiscal capacity can support. Madam Speaker, if we are to propel this economy on a trajectory of higher growth and development, we must restructure our economy to enhance its competitiveness and productivity. The choices are stark. We either embark on the journey of transforming our economy or we continue to wallow in the vicious cycle of low growth, high debt, and high unemployment. My government has chosen the path which will restore the prosperity to our nation. Madam Speaker, this debate provides, as always, an opportunity for reflection and introspection. It is a task we must undertake with an honesty that is brutal and unrelenting. As I reflect on the social face of St. Lucia, I am truly, truly concerned. We are seemingly drowning in a pool of blatant negativity and a decadent behavior. Let us not be shocked by such an assessment. It surrounds us all. Its guises, it surrounds us all in its guises and forms. Crime, violence, abuse, lack of respect for the people and property. These have become the norm and part of our daily existence. We must encourage discourse, but not destruction. We have to set better standards for ourselves and for our children and to take pride in our country, St. Lucia. We're confronted with rising levels of poverty and unemployment. Those who are vulnerable do not look, for the, look with confidence to a system that is supposed to inform, support, and empower them. So their vicious cycle of dependency and that of their household continues with no hope in sight. We breed apathy. We nurture disinterest. We do nothing. Those who choose to deny such a characterization may do so, but my administration will not. For too long, we have wallowed in mediocrity and negativity. Content to stagnate in some instances, even regress, while hiding behind the convenience 
of the socioeconomic cards the world and its system has dealt us. In, this last, in his last budget address as Prime Minister, Sir John Compton lamented the physical, economic, and social divide that was unfolding within our country. He was strong in his conviction that a quantum leap of thought and action was the only way out. Almost 10 years on, his words assume even greater relevance. Madam Speaker, we're at a critical juncture in our development journey. We can either choose to act decisively to affect real change in our country, or we can continue to plot on an old familiar path to nowhere. We can find ways to harness the energy and the industry of the majority of our people. We can seek to utilize and unleash their creativity and talents, or we can allow the minority to continue to paint this sad face of St. Lucia, and we self-destruct as a direct consequence of the inaction of the majority. Our government has chosen the path of change. We are committed to building a new St. Lucia with citizens who are humble and proud, committed to excellence and accepting of all people, thoughts and ideas. We relish the challenge of creating a society that is competitive, productive, and inclusive. Madam Speaker, the, the times demand a new vision for St. Lucia to provide a roadmap for growth and development. It cannot be business as usual, and this new vision will require fundamental and structural changes in the economy. We want to build a St. Lucia which instills pride, a place where businesses can flourish, where people can get jobs, not handouts, where people feel secure, care for each other, can access educational opportunities, receive quality health services, and enjoy a comfortable standard of living without imposing a burden on the future generations. Our approach will engage all sectors of our society and be based on dialogue. Therefore, the following strategic areas of focus will be aggressively pursued over the next four years with the underlying aim of achieving substantial and inclusive growth. One, creating sustainable employment. Two, re-engineering social services. Three, reforming government to make it more responsive to the business community and citizens. Four, improving security and justice. Five, building capacity in renewable energy. And six, adapting to climate change. Madam Speaker, creating sustainable employment is a priority of this government, and we have pledged to work towards an unemployment rate of no more than 15% by 2021, as stated in our manifesto. It is expected that many of the investments within the coming months will create employment throughout the island, particularly in the sectors of tourism, agriculture, and construction. Clearly, our approach is very different from the Labour Party. We aim to create the enabling environment for growth within the private sector by providing incentives, enhancing government support services, improving efficiency in the public sector, and addressing the existing skills gap. We're currently working on a comprehensive incentives package which will create employment within the private sector and provide much needed support to businesses within St. Lucia. More details will be given on the incentive package within the upcoming months. Madam Speaker, as one of the main contributors to the, our economy, the tourism sector will be re-engineered in order to achieve its full potential and to be used as a catalyst for economic growth. We'll work towards building a tourism product that is globally competitive, environmentally and socially sustainable, and will maximize both backward and forward linkages, particularly in our culture, manufacturing, and construction sectors. Madam Speaker, 
it is possible to expand the tourism room stock by 2,000 rooms over the next four years throughout the island. Major tourism investments are expected. We've already witnessed the opening of the Royalton where a minimum of 900 jobs have been created during operations. The Harbour Club is expected to be open towards the end of the third quarter of the calendar where 117 rooms are expected to be available and it's envisioned that the minimum of 150 jobs will be available. Coconut Bay plans a 200 room expansion and is expected to employ a minimum of 400 persons during the construction and an additional 320 jobs on completion. Madam Speaker, there are some other major investments under active consideration. Work will begin on the Fairmont St. Lucia Resort in Sabasha Choiseul in September of this year. This, in, this development will employ 150 workers during construction and 250 workers upon completion. This resort will be unique space that integrates local nature, a low-rise building complex, and a wide range of re recreational facilities. The hotel will include 120 five-star hotel rooms, 37 villas, three restaurants, a spa, commercial areas for local producers and traders, and three swimming pools. A special central place in the development is provided for local tradition. A number of shops for carvings and paintings will feature at the property. The Raidby Beach will be redeveloped and will become the home of a luxury five-star dual-branded hotel called Curio and Hilton. This property will be built where the Rex Resort was previously located. The Curio and the Hilton will feature 500 luxury rooms, 350 rooms assigned to Hilton, and 150 assigned to the Curio brand. This development will cost in excess of US 100 million and, will, and is expected to employ at least 650 workers during operations. Work on this property will begin within the last quarter of 2017. Madam Speaker, we're expecting to work for work to commence on the Honeymoon Bay Resort and Canals very soon. This resort will consist of two hotels. The first is a 250-room, five-star luxury family, all-inclusive hotel. And the second is an 80-room, five-star luxury hotel. This resort will feature an 18-hole golf course and a clubhouse and a museum. The development is expected to cost US $360 million and will employ about 600 workers during the construction and 750 full-time and 300 part-time workers during operation. Madam Speaker, the range developments signed an agreement with the government of St. Lucia to acquire Black Bay lands and develop Black Bay into an integrated master plan luxury touristic community. The Black Bay master development will consist of a luxury branded hotel and villas and other amenities set on 180 acres on the southern tip of the island. The hotel is expected to have 180 rooms and will be the central anchor, anchor of the Black Bay Master Development. The estimated development value of Black Bay Hotel is US 130 million. Initial site works are expected to commence in the fourth quarter of 2017 or the first quarter in 2018. And the hotel is expected to be complete by the end of 2020. Peak employment during the construction phase will be 300 direct hires and 400 during operations. Madam Speaker, Sandals Resorts International has confirmed plans to add a fourth resort on St. Lucia. The property will offer 350 rooms and suites, inclusive of an exotic sky pool, butler suites, all butler signature swim and rendezvous suites, and an infinity edge sky pool bar. This project is estimated to cost US 250 million. Madam Speaker, yet another opportunity for the creation of an estimated 600 jobs during the construction phase and an estimated 875 jobs during the operational phase. Groundbreaking for the project is set to begin in 2018. In addition to these developments, we will focus our efforts on increasing the number of three-star properties on the island as we recognize this is a preferred property type for our European visitors and yachters. The government's policy is to reserve the three-star property developments for St. Lucians and to invest in keeping with the village tourism. Madam Speaker, 
We are looking to increase our room stock in stock this. Madam Speaker, we are looking to increase our room stock, and this has the effect of increasing our capacity and hence make St. Lucia a more competitive to increasing airlift and open the possible markets which were previously untapped. We'll create and capitalize on the concept of village tourism. Eight existing fishing villages will be transformed into unique tourism villages based on their attributes and strengths. These villages will be uniquely themed and development plans will be established in a participatory manner which will address the village's infrastructure, culinary assets, architecture, and capacity. This is in support of an expansion of the shared economy in which much the same way that Groselet continues to benefit from village tourism. This, this opportunity is further enhanced by the continuation and success of Airbnb. We'll further develop our niche markets of romance, family and adventure-based tourism, and expand our offerings in areas of ecotourism, sports tourism, and business tourism. Madam Speaker, it is our intention that everyone in society be given an opportunity to benefit from tourism development at some level. This is clear given the decentralization of the tourism-related investments, particularly the development of Viewport as a new tourism frontier. Our government will continue to provide support, including financial support, for persons in hospitality training. One of these, per one of these persons have successfully completed their programs. Once these persons have successfully completed their programs, they will be eligible for employment with many of the major cruise lines. We intend to train a minimum of 500 persons in this financial year. Madam Speaker, to generate employment opportunities, especially within the south of the island, for example, our government has partnered with Ojo Labs International to develop an artificial intelligence training and call center to market and sell their products, services, software, and technology of Ojo and its clients, including the fastest growing real estate company in the United States. By September, Ojo will occupy leased retrofitted premises within the St. Lucia Free Zone to house this facility. Employees will be recruited and trained starting this month. It is anticipated that 50 jobs in the area of artificial intelligence training will be immediately created with the plan to expand ultimately to over 200. This is the first for the Caribbean and will provide our people with advanced technological skills that are not currently available, that are currently non unavailable in the, in the region. This will provide an opportunity for our young people to expose to cutting edge technology from a first world company. Madam Speaker, this government recognizes the importance of agriculture, particularly for creating employment, especially in rural communities for reducing poverty, generating income and achieving food security. Our government will create the environment to enable the private sector to participate in the development of the agriculture sector and foster a commercialized approach to livestock, rearing, fresh produce farming, and fishing. We will revitalize the banana industry and increase banana production. The Ranju farms have been identified as available farmlands, which will be utilized for banana cultivation. These lands will be leased to the farmers through Winfesh. Madam Speaker, a banana productivity improvement project will be undertaken during this financial year. In addition to addressing the issues related to leaf spot control, that project will oversee the expansion of the current acreage by 600 to 1,000 hectare acres, arrest decline in production, and rebuild farmers' confidence, increase productivity to 37 to 49 tons per hectare acre, and restore production to satisfy the requirements of the market. With these efforts, an export target of 60 to 70,000 tons is anticipated by year three of the project. Assistance will be provided with the input supply, leaf spot control, land development and drainage. Measures will also be adopted to build res resilience to climate change and steps will be taken to help farmers mitigate the effects of natural disasters or economic shocks. New opportunities will be created for generating income and employment in rural areas 
by expanding and diversifying production. Specific crops will be targeted and grown using greenhouse technology in an effort to reduce the seasonality of these crops. Additionally, specific farmers will be identified as producers for these crops, and these farmers will enter into contracts with hotels for the constant supply of fresh produce. Madam Speaker, I am confident that this measure will reduce the uncertainty of supply amongst both farmers and hoteliers and create the environment for additional linkages to be made. Madam Speaker, this government's agricultural diversification strategy will focus on, a national, on national food security, the exploration and exploitation of niche markets for non-traditional products, and in so doing, optimizing the employment opportunities available within the agricultural sector. Through the Agricultural Transformation Program, ATP, of the Banana Accompanying Measures, BAM, project, a number of com components will be, undertaken, will be undertaken. The first component is the refurbishment and retrofitting of agro-processing facilities on the island. The second component is the construction of a national diagnostic facility. This activity is designed to enhance our research and technology cap capability. The third component is disaster risk reduction in agriculture. It includes the procurement of inputs to control the Black Sigatoga disease. The rehabilitation of farm community infrastructure is also part of this component. The initial focus was on drainage and riverbank stabilization. We will also pay, place emphasis on rehabilitation of farm roads, commonly referred to as feeder roads. The fourth component is the Youth Agricultural Enterprise Facilitation Program, which seeks to create the enabling environment to allow the entry of approximately 150 persons into agriculture as young entrepreneurs. The objective is to increase the number of new farmers. The YET is also an incubator program designed to accelerate the pace at which St. Lucia's agricultural sector is modernized, transformed, and diversified. Madam Speaker, our road network has deteriorated badly over the years, and funds allocated have been insufficient to adequately maintain the roads. This has been made worse by the extreme weather events. In the last fiscal year, only $5.35 million was spent on road repairs and maintenance. And we, was, and we all see the poor results. The Department of, of Infrastructure has prepared a comprehensive plan for the restoration of our road network. This plan is expected to be executed over five years, with the restor restorative works to be carried out throughout the island at an estimated cost of approximately $479 million. We intend to explore cost-effective options for financing this year's program. The rehabilitation and maintenance of the road network will include the following. Repairs and maintenance, potholing, drainage and retaining structures, and grills on primary, secondary, and tertiary roads. The acquisition of road maintenance management system, which will assist in the Department of Infrastructure in planning their maintenance programs. Reconstruction and rehabilitation of bridges, culverts, and water crossings. A bridge condition assessment has been undertaken island-wide. This study has identified the bridges to be maintained or replaced. Rehabilitation of roads within the city, towns, and villages. Road works associated with the shock to Groselay Highway. Rehabilitation of the Millennium Highway roadway and junction improvement. Procurement and acquisition of road safety equipment. This includes traffic lights, guardrails, road signs, and other equipment. We will endeavor to undertake the rehabilitation of approximately 38.9 kilometers of agriculture and feeder roads in various parts of the island. Madam Speaker, in the Northern Highway from Castries to Groselay is the busiest stretch of road in St. Lucia. And based on current trends, it is expected to become, if it has not already, even more congested in the coming years. In December, our cabinet considered all the options available 
for addressing the congestion issue and directed the Department of Infrastructure, Infrastructure to undertake the following. One, full rehabilitation of the bypass roads to provide drivers with viable alternatives to the highway. Two, an in-depth review of the shock bridge to ensure economy in the designs. Feasibility studies for the North-South Highway is complete and all indications are that this is the long-term solution to the issue of the congestion in the city and cast threes to Groselay Highway. Our government has decided that a holistic long-term solution is necessary and our only choice. And speaker, I move to a project known to St. Lucians as the SH. Or every time I hear it, I call it I call it Delivering Southern Hope. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there's been much discussion regarding the DSH project. But regrettably, a lot of it has been in ill-informed. I'm now grateful for the opportunity to clarify the details of this existing, exciting investment which has the ability to transform the face of the South and to provide much needed hope to the thousands of unemployed youth who have been neglected for too long. Finally, we can bring some relief to the South. The government of St. Lucia has entered into a framework agreement with Desert Star Holdings, limited for the development of the Pearl of the Caribbean. I would like to recognize in the house tonight the owner and chairman of Desert Start Holdings, um, and that is Mr. Teo Ake. The Pearl of the Caribbean has three phases and will include a race course, residential properties, casino, hotel, marina, and recreational park. The project will be phased over 20 years with the racetrack at Beau View Fort comprising the first phase of the project. Madam Speaker, let me say for all to hear, this is the only phase of the project that has been approved by my government thus far. All other plans are under consideration are being and are being reviewed, Madam Speaker, and on completion of the review, we'll continue con we will continue consultations with all stakeholders, particularly residents and property owners in the South. Madam Speaker, please permit me to show the most recent details for phase three of the project. As you can see, following the initial consultations, the developer has listened to the concerns of the people and fulfilled his promise that the design will not connect to Maria Island, but in looking to enhance the Point Sab Bay. The DCA has granted approval in principle for the racetrack pending an environmental and social impact assessment. This assessment is now complete and has been submitted. Madam Speaker, as we can see by the photographs, I think we all have to recognize the genius of Mr. Teake and the outstanding work that he has done in other parts of the world and that he would choose to come to St. Lucia and to bring this level of creativity, energy, and his level of contacts to the benefit of our island. Madam Speaker, we know that this is a bold and sweeping project that the scale of the project is unprecedented. But at the time, so was Pigeon Island, the Millennium Highway, yeah. the John Compton Dam, yeah. the Hess Oil Refinery, yeah. and the Rodney Bay Marina. Yeah. And we cannot be afraid to embrace the development because without it, there is no hope for our people. The jobs they need so desperately will not fall from the sky 
We must create them. And solutions can be assured that we will do so. And we will do it in a manner which marries respect for our environment with the need to develop. For the, for the two must go hand in hand. Phase one of the project will be implemented later this year, all in relation to the racetrack. Domestic and international barns, equestrian lawn, equine clinic and quarantine barn, fractional ownership of Homestead Villa, race course boulevard, infield park and polo field, and a permanent grandstand and a temporary grandstand. During the construction phase, there'll be an estimated 500 to 800 persons on site with a management team of 10 to 20 persons. Once the race course is operational, persons will receive training and employment in the areas of horse husbandry, maintenance facilities, and management of the race course and training of the race horses. On average, the race horse industry three, says that three to four jobs are created for every thoroughbred, such jobs being jockeys, trainers, barn managers, groundkeepers, groomers, veterinarians, vet assistants, and blacksmiths. It is estimated that we will have over 400 horses, thoroughbred horses, in residence at the Royal St. Lucia Turf Club. Madam Speaker, the DSH project are delivering Southern Hope. Will transform View Fort from the ghost town that it has become under the Labour Party administration into a modern, progressive city full of opportunities for its citizens. No longer will high rates of joblessness plague View Fort. No longer will the people of the South feel like abandoned children. This project will also make use of underutilized lands in the South, particularly in Beausanjou and create several ancillary industries and linkages with existing businesses. The opportunities this project presents are endless, and our government is grateful to the developer for expressing this level of confidence in our country, in our government to make such a large-scale investment here. We welcome this development and look forward to the job opportunities it will provide to our young people, particularly those from the South. Madam Speaker, our government is committed to the development of the Huonora International Airport. On assuming office, SLASPA had engaged the International Finance Corporation to serve as a lead advisor to develop and advise the feasibility of implementing a public-private sector partnership transaction for the development of HIA. On review of the IFC proposal, our government decided to embark upon exploring alternative financing arrangements within the context of a broader vision for the development in View 4, which includes the development of the HIA and also a cruise ship terminal. Madam Speaker, as part of the development of View 4, we aim to enhance the natural deep water harbor to accommodate cruise ships and build, uh, build out a home porting facility given its close proximity to the airport. Yeah. Announcement on the confirmation of the financing we made later this year. Madam Speaker, there is no question that our city is desperate need for redevelopment if we are to, competi to be competitive and modern and ready to face the future. I speak of cast trees, Madam Speaker. My government will undertake several projects which we envision are critical to the modernization of the city. Traffic congestion must be addressed and the construction of a new cargo port at cul-de-sac will enable the relocation of the cargo operations. The port will be enhanced to accommodate larger cruise ships and a marina. The free land area will become available for significant cruise-related com commercial, entertainment, and residential developments. These redevelopments will include shops and plazas, duty-free shopping zones, and restaurants. Sewage treatment in the castries has long been unacceptable. The construction of a sewage treatment facility to handle the black water generated by the areas of central castries that are connected to the sewage network is a priority 
as well as a precondition for the expansion of cruise and water-related activities in Castries Harbor. The International Business Companies Act has been amended to allow the headquarters of regional companies to be located in St. Lucia. My government will be following up this legislation with incentives for local developers to construct residential, commercial, and mixed-use developments to accommodate these companies. Madam Speaker, we must put a more equitable and just society. All sections of our population, particularly the most vulnerable, must have access to a system that provides support and services. And we must build a society that is proactive and embraces risk in a positive way. Madam Speaker, this new society must be anchored on the pillars of the individual, the family, and the community. Accordingly, our social services regime must be reoriented. Our newly configured Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Culture, and Local Government and Youth Development and Sports has been tasked with the responsibility of bringing life to this vision. At the core of this new system for administration of services and programs within the sector is the local government authority. Every intervention, every extension service must now be placed within this context. It means our social transformation officer, our family case worker, our youth and sports officer, all must work within the framework of that local government jurisdiction. And that the same must apply to those agencies like SSDF, Bell Fund, and CDF. Every provider of services will determine its role within the broader mandate of facilitating the growth of compassionate and resilient individuals, families, and communities. Our government will develop the after-school program as a model to demonstrate this new arrangement. In recent times, this program has been regarded as a standalone intervention administered through the Community Services Development Unit, but we recognize that there is potential to realize even more significant benefits. In the area of sports, we intend to focus on sports like football, basketball, and athletics, where we believe the greatest opportunity exists for our young persons to progress academically and professionally. We'll endeavor to engage coaches at the community level, as opposed to the more recent school-based efforts, which can lead to delusion of the overall coaching impact. Similarly, within the creative arts sector, we will create an avenue for CDF and other creative arts facilitators to enhance the quality of talent at the individual and community level. Madam Speaker, this approach will link school to community, community to sporting and cultural organizations, and ultimately ensure that our youth, primarily those at risk, are productively engaged. It will also serve to minimize the use of our school plant, sorry, it will also serve to maximize the use of our school plant and community centers, which traditionally are underutilized for significant periods of the day. We will try to engage through our youth empowerment service program, those out of school, out of work boys and girls who are unoccupied through initiatives such as after school program. We will do this through our partnership with the CDB and USAID. Madam Speaker, we must transform our social protection system in order to assure access to services for those most in need. It is unacceptable that in this era of technology, where the need for data and evidence-based decision-making is in incessant, that we are re 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 referencing poverty data that is over 10 years old. It is equally unacceptable that we have not established an architecture that enables us to be more client-friendly. We'll therefore initiate this new system by supporting the conduct of the country poverty assessment, inclusive of a quantitative and qualitative assessment. We will also, after years of delay, finalize a targeting instrument, the SL-net proxy means test, 
to ensure that we could categorically identify those who require the state support. I want to stress that this instrument, which will incorporate income and non-income criteria, and will be administered and utilized by all ministries, agencies, departments, and organizations delivering state-supported and or endorsed social services. Such an instrument, however, will be useless unless we establish a central registry or database to enable us to adopt one client, one record system that provides a historical map of a particular applicant outlining his or her circumstances, support provided and noted achievements and impacts. The final pillar of this reform is the integration of social, financial, and other forms of assistance. Madam Speaker, in order to realize the transformation in our economy, education must be given priority. Education must be seen as the platform to enable citizens to attain their full potential. Our population growth is slowing, and we have a fast declining school age population. We will conduct a comprehensive assessment of all public schools, their inventory and students in order to maximize the use and resources deployed at our island schools. Additionally, a diagnostic study of the education system will be undertaken to inform the transformation of the education sector. The government will introduce and enforce standards throughout the education system. These will include standards for school buildings and infrastructure, school supervision, policy administration, teacher preparation, and curriculum delivery. At the level of early childhood education and development, we recognize the private sector is playing a critical role as the main provider. Therefore, the government through the Ministry of Education will work towards the setting and monitoring of standards which should be adhered to by early childhood education facilities. Additionally, vacant space in primary schools will be utilized for the provision of early childhood education. Madam Speaker, we are living in a rapidly changing world, one which continues to evolve through globalization and information and communication technology. We must prepare our students to compete globally by modernizing our curriculum and incorporating technology into the delivery of lessons. The use of ICT must be embraced by students and teachers, and a greater effort must be made to incorporate ICT into the education system. The Ministry of Education will work with our teachers to develop digital content catered specifically for students. It is our intention to reduce the dependence on textbooks and create an environment which embraces electronic learning. Madam Speaker, it is our intention to create a generation which is technology literate, who can use ICTs for productive means and are capable of functioning effectively in a globally technologically driven society. Additionally, the Ministry of Education will source platforms which will allow for independent learning by students and caters to individual learning styles. Madam Speaker, the highest attainable standard for, of healthcare as a fundamental right of every human being is enshrined in the World Health Organization's constitution. My government is committed to providing improved health care to all the citizens of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, the health sector requires an immediate overhaul. The quality of health care, the legislative framework, human resources for health, and on very importantly, health financing are all areas on which our government will focus. Too many of our people are denied access to health care because they simply cannot afford it. Too many of our children are dying because their parents cannot pay for critical care. This cannot and will not continue. The Ministry of Health estimates that a minimum basic package of health services for the population will cost approximately $179 million. This cost will allow for the provision of primary, secondary, and tertiary care services. 
and is primarily to be able to bring the new hospitals on board. The funding will be used to cover the operating and maintaining of the two new hospitals, improving primary care services by increasing hours of operation in support of the hospitals, and strengthening mental health services. Currently, the budget for Ministry of Health is $110 million. Hence, there is a financial <coughs> gap of $69 million. We were given the option to increase NIC by 5% which would generate an additional 55 million. This would only allow us to open up the hospitals. It meant that the people who could not afford healthcare before would still not be able to afford it now. And so, Madam Speaker, this was not an option. Our objective for this sector is to transform the government's role from a direct provider of healthcare services through hospitals and clinics and a direct funder through budgetary subventions to a policymaker and a regulator. My government aims to achieve this by implementing a two-pronged strategy, which pursues public-private partnerships for provision of services and the introduction of a national health insurance. My government believes that to preserve the future sustainability of the sector, we must establish a financial mechanism. Madam Speaker, my government aims to utilize the resources of the National Health Care Insurance Fund to finance health care. A number of matters will be addressed, including purchasing and contracting with public-private sector providers, consumer choice, the administration of the fund, and the regulations of the, fin the finalization of the packages, packages of services to be provided to all registrants for health service. The aim is to provide health coverage to all our people as too many are falling through the cracks. Number three, reforming government to make it more responsive to the business community and citizens. I turn now to reforming the government to make it more responsive to the business community and citizens. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the Inland Revenue Department's electronic payment platform has gone live as of March 21st, 2017. Electronic payments are now possible for all major tax types, for both individuals and businesses using either a debit or credit card. This is just one practical example of steps taken by the government to improve the business environment, thereby improving the ease of doing business in St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, I mentioned earlier that there was a need to improve productivity in our economy if we are to build a competitive and robust economy. This will no doubt require a comprehensive re-engineering of the public service, given this, its size and influence on the rest of the economy. The public service continues to operate as it did in 1980s. Since then, the world has changed dramatically, but the public service has continued to operate business as usual. Being guided by the staff orders of the, for the public service of St. Lucia issued in the 1980s. The public service of day, Madam Speaker, must be fixed. I intend, Madam Speaker, to ensure that we have the public service management bill tabled in this house within this financial year. The citizens of today are more demanding and require a better and high quality of service. The public service must therefore have at its fundamental objective the provision of excellence in service delivery. Many services ought to be accessible and available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. But in order for this to happen, Madam Speaker, there must be a comprehensive changes in the legislation, the accountability systems, and the introduction of relevant ICT. Madam Speaker, expenditure on wages and salaries inclusive of NIC contributions on behalf of the public officers is just under 410 million, or about 35.4% 30, of the total recurrent expenditure budget. It's important that we ensure that the taxpayers get value for money and that the proper accountability systems are put in place in the public service. In this regard, Madam Speaker, we've started the work of developing a results oriented framework for the budget. This framework is to be cascaded to the level of the public officer, so the accountability is established at all levels. 
I'm convinced, Madam Speaker, that unless we hold every public officer accountable for the work that they do, we will continue to perpetuate in a situation in which the public service continues to operate inefficiently with everyone playing the blame game. We need to embrace ICT in the public service to reduce costs and improve efficiency and service delivery. I am keen to see the introduction of online services to better services service our people. Once a person has access to the internet, services can be accessed from the convenience of their homes. In the case of driver's licenses, there should be no need to drive to Union to apply for a license renewal. There is no reason these applicants cannot be made online. Madam Speaker, the departments in the public service continue to operate largely in a vacuum, and turf control is the order of the day. This has resulted in widespread inefficiency about which our citizens complain from one year to another, but which only seems to get worse. We can no longer afford to allow the public service to operate in this manner, and we must put in place the systems and processes to ensure that a holistic government approach is taken in making decisions on critical policy matters which have implications for more than one agency. It is for this reason, Madam Speaker, that we've created a system of clusters whereby relevant agencies are grouped within a particular cluster to work together. This approach should allow the greater, for greater collaboration and cooperation among agencies within the cluster and therefore lead to better policy formulation and implementation. After reviewing the state of the economy, it has become quite clear that we must embark upon a strategy to significantly grow this economy if we're to manage debt, provide sustainable productive employment, and improve the standard of living of all citizens. My government believes there is sufficient potential within St. Lucia that from 2018 onwards, we can generate and maintain high levels of growth. This growth will, be, will initially be driven by the construction and tourism sectors, with linkages being capitalized on in our culture, manufacturing, and real estate. This growth will not be localized to any one group of individuals, but will be a growth that will be felt throughout the economy and enjoyed by all. We've begun the consultative process with stakeholders on the development of a growth strategy which focuses on productive employment, equity, enhancing the business environment, building our innovative capacities, and upgrading the skills of our human resources. Thus far, we've identified a number of bottlenecks to growth including low productivity, lack of skilled work workers, limited access to credit, and the high cost of operation. We will continue our work with the private sector and civil society on sustainable solutions to these challenges, as well as the eventual development of a national growth strategy. Madam Speaker, access to credit has long been a challenge for us in St. Lucia, both at the household level, but more so for the private sector. Difficulty in accessing credit continues to constrain economic activity within our country. The challenge is not due to the lack of liquidity, but rather risk-adverse lenders concerned about the high levels of default of loans within St. Lucia. The delinquency of some has resulted in all of us being penalized by elevated interest rates and more stringent conditions to excess loans. In the upcoming year, the government will continue work with all stakeholders on the establishment of a credit bureau, a registry of movable assets, and a secured transaction system. New, more relevant legislation and regulations are being drafted on insolvency. This suite of legislation will provide the mechanisms to ensure viable businesses continue as ongoing concern, as a going concern, and preserve their value despite encountering financial challenges. A sector transaction bill is also being drafted, which results in a modern functional secure transaction system, which features a modern collateral registry. The secure transactions reform will allow many small businesses and entrepreneurs to utilize non-traditional forms of collateral, such as inventory and other movable assets to secure credit to expand their businesses. Madam Speaker, all of these actions are meant to address the challenges which we face as a country and accessing credit. Madam Speaker, this government will work to improve the administration of justice and the security of our country. St. Lucia's courts have been without a home for some time. 
which has resulted in delays in the hearing of cases and the rising remand population in the prisons. The courts will be temporarily relocated to the national, to, sorry, the courts will be temporarily relocated to the grounds of the National Cultural Center. A temporary structure will be erected to house the Family Court, First District Court, the High Court, Magistrates Court, and the offices of the Director of Prosecutions, while the National Culture Center will be relocated to an alternative location. Madam Speaker, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions has been short of resources for some time. This has hindered the pace at which cases can be handled. We will strengthen the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution through adequate staffing and the provision of another enabling, other enabling services, such as proper equipment. This will further assist with the reduction in the backlog of cases. Madam Speaker, we can report that the, with the appointment of the new DPP, significant progress has already been made in reducing the backlog of cases. And I would like to publicly congratulate him and his department on their outstanding success thus far. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to report that the Forensic Science Laboratory reopened during this financial year. We expect this to assist the Royal St. Lucia Police Force in their crime-fighting efforts. In addition, we will increase the resources of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force by training 46 recruits and providing additional vehicles and other much-needed equipment. We cannot keep expecting our police to perform better if we not give them the necessary support and tools to perform. Madam Speaker, through our intelligence-driven crime-fighting strategies, we aim to increase surveillance within the city of Castries with the installation of a CCT camera throughout the city, particularly in the areas prone to crime. The government will be par partnering with the private sector in the supply and maintenance of cameras. Madam Speaker, there's a need to improve organizational effectiveness within the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. A number of senior police officers have retired and it is the intention of my government to establish a leadership training program to ensure proper succession plan and to provide effective leadership at all levels of the police force. Our government is committed to ensuring that officers are kept abreast of new and advanced crime fighting techniques. Madam Speaker, permit me to turn my attention to the issue of security at our air and seaports. At present, four agencies perform, at present, four agencies perform border management functions in St. Lucia. These are Customs, Excise Department, Immigration Department, Marine Unit, and the Quarantine Division of the Department of Agriculture. Collectively, these agencies have the responsibility for overseeing the movement of people, animals, and plants the imports and exports of goods, and the services of securing St. Lucia's borders. Madam Speaker, these agencies are facing elevated security threats, increased global trade and scarcity of resources. Other challenges include archaic data storage and retrieval practices, inadequate sharing of information, non-transparent legislation, and increased procedure requirements, as well as a greater demand against their resources due into increased travel and trade into, our, into St. Lucia. These factors have placed an immense burden on these agencies and on the resources of the government of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, there's a need to rethink our approach to securing our borders, which would bring about greater efficiency and effectiveness in the dispensation of border control and management. To this end, we will develop a border control services agency. This agency will be responsible for border management and the processing of people, goods, plants, and animals at all ports of entry, customs and immigration services, enforcement of relevant legislation, protection of St. Lucia's borders. And Madam Speaker, we expect that the formation of one agency with responsibility for border management will correct many of the existing deficiencies. To this end, the committee has been set up with the representatives from key agencies to examine the options for the establishment of a border control service agency. Madam Speaker, the great scientist Albert Einstein once said, 
in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And the challenging global economic situation has forced countries to seek creative new means of promoting social and economic development. While generally recognized as a critical factor of production and one vital for overall national development, energy has usually not been seen as a sector in which in its own right within our country. We wish to change this view and to foster the development of a national sustainable energy sector that will spur investment and job creation while broadening and diversifying the national economy and supporting efforts at protecting the environment and combating climate change. This objective will be pursued through a sustainable energy sector development strategy. This strategy will be to increase the demand for sustainable energy services in the economy. To this end, government will seek to continue and to accelerate ongoing work on the diffusion of renewable energy and energy technologies. This means that government will more aggressively pursue the installation of photovoltaic and solar hot water systems on public buildings. Government will also seek to advance ongoing work in the areas of geothermal exploration and solar farm development. Madam Speaker, the strategy will also include the promotion of increased manufacturing energy enterprises in Seleucia. For many years now, the manufacture of assembly of solar water heaters has been undertaken in our country. It is now time to diversify the manufacturing place to include photovoltaic and other components and energy efficient street lamps and street lightning as this will be achieved by directly targeting investment in this area. Government will pursue the development and implementation of energy efficiency guidelines to reduce energy costs in its operations and to further signal its readiness to be an exemplar in energy use. This sustainable energy sector development strategy, Madam Speaker, will be to encourage energy innovation. We will aim to reduce dependence on fossil fuels while at the same time increasing foreign exchange through reduction of imports of fossil fuels. Madam Speaker, a fully fledged energy sector will require the presence of corresponding enabling environment and a comprehensive review of the relevant policy, legislation, and fiscal, and, and fiscal framework will be undertaken. Madam Speaker, climate change poses a major challenge to our sustainable development and a threat to the very survival of many small island developing states. The successive hottest years on record, rising sea levels, the increasingly violent tropical storms, crop failures, the outbreaks of vector-borne diseases in new parts of the world, these all bear testimony to the seemingly inevitable onslaught of climate change. No matter what the naysayers would have us believe, this phenomena we all know is a reality. What is even more, what, what, what is more, even the proverbial ostrich can no longer bury his head in the sand as the sand has now grown too hot. In other words, Madam Speaker, inaction will not make climate change disappear. It is widely known that although St. Lucia and other small island states are not the main contributors to global warming, they are among the most vulnerable to climate impacts. Our survival is at stake. We must take action now. Adaptation continues to be a major concern as we seek to build resilience in our water, agriculture, tourism, health, fisheries, and other sectors. Over the last decade, a number of pilot adaptation projects have been implemented, but these need to be significantly scaled up if we are to meaningfully adapt to climate change. In December of 2015, in ratifying the Paris Agreement, St. Lucia undertook a nationally determined contribution that once implemented, will see sharp reductions in St. Lucia's greenhouse gas emissions through, through, among others, the diffusion of renewable energy and energy efficient technologies and practices. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, climate change adapt, adaptation and emissions reduction or mitigation will not come cheaply. While we must pay attention to ensuring our own survival and to play our part towards the greater global good, we will not be able to adapt or mitigate fast enough relying purely on our own resources. 
As such, this financial year, a particular effort will be made to pursue available climate financing from various sources. We will focus on expanding <coughs> access to Green Climate Fund and other similar climate entities, and we will address institutional and other barriers which have impeded access to such financing. Madam Speaker, every effort will be made to achieve synergy between climate change and energy agendas. Madam Speaker, the government is currently working on a medium-term fiscal strategy aimed at crafting a clear path towards growing the economy while improving St. Lucia's fiscal and debt position. From 2012 to 2016, the level of public debt continued to grow. While some measures have been taken to curtail expenditure while improving revenue intake, we are still spending more than we collect in revenue resulted in increased borrowing and higher public debt. The, low, the lower levels of economic growth have not helped in corresponding our fiscal imbalance, in correcting our fiscal balance. Hence, the fiscal strategy that we will adopt entails a two-pronged approach of increasing the level of growth while improving the productivity of expenditure. Madam Speaker, we will soon be introducing to this Honorable House a new public financial management bill. The bill does not only set new guidelines for the management of the country's finances, but requires the Minister of Finance to report to Parliament no later than one month after the second quarter of every financial year on the state of the public finances. My government has made tax reforms a major priority over the medium term. In this regard, Madam Speaker, work has already commenced in a number of areas geared toward improving competitiveness and stimulating growth. Madam Speaker, one of the promises made in our 2016 manifesto is to provide tax relief to St. Lucians in the areas of personal and corporate income tax and VAT. In keeping with this promise, on the 1st of February 2017, we reduced the VAT rate from 15% to 12.5% as part of the initial VAT reform. In this view, this government in the, in, 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 it is the view of this government that a reduction in VAT will reduce prices to the consumer and or boost profits for business, thereby stimulating confidence in the economy. Madam Speaker, our manufacturers have complained about the burden from VAT on the imported raw materials used in their production processes. Unfortunately, their cries have fallen on deaf ears. Given that VAT is a border-adjusted tax, when goods are imported into St. Lucia, the manufacturer is required to pay the VAT upon clearance of the goods. This input VAT incurred is claimable and is offset against any VAT collected when the VAT return form is submitted by the 21st of the following month. If the manufacturer collects less output VAT than the amount paid on inputs, then the difference is refunded within four to six weeks of processing his claim. This, Madam Speaker, can create an unnecessary cash flow constraint, thus adding to the financial burden on manufacturers. In that, they must source financing either from local financing or overdraft, which can be expensive and render the businesses uncompetitive. Madam Speaker, we have designed a VAT deferral system to minimize the impact of the VAT obligations faced by manufacturers. This system will eliminate the VAT payment on the imports and raw materials, and no such payment is required subsequently to the extent that the manufacturer is allowed to claim the full input of VAT. For example, a manufacturer has VAT payable on imports of 20,000, the manufacturer will be allowed to clear the goods with no payment of his VAT. If the manufacturer is entitled to claim 100% of inputs for that month, there will be no cash, no, be no cash VAT payment on that transaction. A payment will be required to the extent that a portion of, his, of, of this input VAT is not claimable and the manufacturer has no VAT refundable. This gives manufacturers immediate use of the imports to manufacture and to sell the goods that they have produced. The IRD has already produced a draft legislation to allow for the implementation of the deferral tax system on certain imports. This draft legislation will therefore be amended to incorporate raw materials imported by approved manufacturers. 
and I wish to highlight the reforms that my government proposes to undertake in respect of personal income tax. Any property, properly structured personal income tax system, Madam Speaker, must be seen as fair in the sense that it is progressive and simple to administer, both from a taxpayer and a tax administrative perspective. The overall competitiveness of the economy will be improved if we are able to achieve this objective. The reforms proposed are extensive, Madam Speaker. Allow me to describe the scope and the flaws of our current system and explain how my government wishes to reform it. Personal income tax is currently calculated as a total income one earns less the personal allowances and any deductions which serves to determine charitable income, chargeable income. This chargeable income is taxed under a multi-rate and multi-band system. In addition to having the first $18,000 or $24,000 in the case of pensioners exempt, persons can reduce their chargeable income by making a claim of any combination of the 28 existing deductions, some of which have numerical caps and some of which do not. This has resulted in, one, the requirements of taxpayers to file and to verify claims of deductions a considerable amount of resources being allocated by inland revenue in the processing of the tax returns. Three, huge variances between tax collected and tax due from taxpayers as a result of deductions made during the year. This gives rise to overpayments by some taxpayers. Data shows that in any given year, this overpayment may be to the tune of 15 million. Currently, we owe 30 million in refunds. The magnitude of deductions claimed is correlated to income. Simply put, high income earners have the ability to make significant claims for deductions, thereby significantly reducing chargeable income and tax otherwise. In light of these issues, Madam Speaker, the policy direction of the government with respect to PAYE is as follows. One, simplify the system such that filing is no longer required by the taxpayers. Two, allow more progressive progressivity in the system. It is therefore proposed, Madam Speaker, that both the personal allowances and the applicable reductions be reformed with a view to simplifying the system while simultaneously make it more progressive. It is also the intention of the government to place a cap on personal income tax. We will make an announcement, Madam Speaker, of the changes to be made in the personal income tax prior to its implementation before the end of this year. Madam Speaker, it is the intention of this government to introduce a foreign residency program that will allow high net worth persons to take up residence in St. Lucia. In order to qualify, the foreign resident will have to invest in real estate, open a company that hires more than 10 people, or invest in our soon-to-be sovereign fund. Those persons, once they have acquired residence in St. Lucia, will be treated like St. Lucians, except they will not have the right to vote, nor will they have the, be entitled to a St. Lucian passport. The government has commissioned a study to review mechanisms to enhance the competitiveness of the existing CIP program and to amend the tax legislation to make it attractive for foreign persons to become tax residents of St. Lucia. As a result of the studies, government will be taking steps to establish a sovereign wealth fund that will allow participants in the CIP program the option of making an investment in the fund alongside the government of St. Lucia. The fund will be designed to ensure that it meets appropriate governance standards and will be staffed by professional investment managers. It is expected that the majority of the fund's capital will be deployed in liquid foreign de de denominated securities, with the balance being earmarked for suitable investments in the solution economy. Profits derived from the investments in the fund are expected to be used for central government expenditure. Madam Speaker, the government has taken steps to encourage greater participation in CIP. Honorable members would be aware that the donation component was reduced from $300,000 to U.S. $100,000. In addition to this, my government intends to continue strengthening the background checks and work towards stronger and regional standardization. Madam Speaker, we will take measures to strengthen background checks. We expect an increase in number of applicants as more projects are being implemented. Madam Speaker, over the years, we have not been able to allocate enough money to maintain our road network, which has come under tremendous pressure from the rapidly increasing number of vehicles on our roads. In 2016, Madam Speaker, the number of vehicles imported into St. Lucia increased by 40% to 
to 3,137. There's been increased traffic congestion, resulting deterioration of our, of our roads. The high level of public debt and the current sources of tax revenue do not allow sufficient resources for road rehabilitation and expansion of the road network, which will cost $479 million. Therefore, my government, in keeping with our manifesto promise of identifying, identi of identifying dedicated streams of revenue for any new expenditure, will dictate a stream of revenue, uh, will dedicate a stream of revenue to go towards maintaining, maintaining and upgrading the road network and associated infrastructure such as bridges. This stream of revenue will come from an increase in the excise tax on gasoline and diesel, which will be increased from $2.50 a gallon to $4. This will take effect June of 2017. It is anticipated this will be the fairer tax as it will be based on usage and consumption. Madam Speaker, the time has come to tackle our national debt problem. For too long, successive governments have been paying lip service to the situation, and the problem gets worse each year. This government will not let another term go by with no decisive action. To do so would be to undermine our fiscal reform effort and to jeopardize the potential that this country has to enter into a new era of sustained higher economic growth. We owe this to future generations, and we must tackle it now. And so we've developed a medium-term debt management strategy to address this situation, the objective of which is to analyze the costs and risk inherent within the debt portfolio, refinancing the interest rate risk and refinancing risk. The strategy document comes against a background of adverse economic and financial developments within the ECCU, including St. Lucia. The management of the debt program involves the design and implementation of debt strategies which will, in, which will effectively align the debt level with fiscal sustainability. Madam Speaker, our current debt burden has hindered our ability to accumulate buffers and to implement fiscal policies to spur economic growth needed to place the country on a more sustainable path. The current debt portfolio consists of largely of short-term domestic debt, putting significant pressure on cash flow and creating high rollover risk. Madam Speaker, to solve the debt problem, we will have to do our fair share as a government and as a people. We cannot do it alone. To restore the public finances, we must recognize that our, fish, our fiscal stability is a shared interest for all stakeholders in our economy. We will have to act in a partnership with the private sector and with our bilateral and multilateral stakeholders. The burden of adjustments will have to be shared by all. Over the next few months, we plan to announce several initiatives which we believe are necessary to place our debt on a sustainable path. Madam Speaker, this budget is geared towards revenue reform, restructuring of the tax system, and enhancing economic growth. However, we must exercise fiscal responsibility and discipline. We must look carefully at transfers and determine whether the performance of statutory bodies and affiliated agencies justifies continued support of these agencies. There are many, there may be instances where merger of agencies or the elimination of or reduction of transfers and the most suitable, or could be the most suitable option. In some cases, the environment has evolved and the purpose for the creation of these agencies no longer exists. In other instances, agency may be better placed to operate as a private institution and allow market forces to set rates and determine the true cost of operations. This is no easy task, but is a necessary, it is necessary part of the journey to exercising fiscal discipline and reducing our debt burden. Madam Speaker, the first agency of government for which transfers has been reduced is the St. Lucia Tourist Board. Upon assuming my office, my government took the decision to close the St. Lucia Tourist Board and to establish the St. Lucia Tourism Authority. This resulted in a reduction of administrative expenses from $8.6 million in 2016-17 to $5.6 million program for 2017 financial year. We've also identified a number of other agencies whose operations and performances have been reviewed and a determination will be made on their continuation in their current form and in, in the coming weeks and months these include the St. Lucia Marketing Board. St. Lucia Marketing Board was established in 1968 
to solve food and marketing deficiencies which existed at the time. The primary purpose of the board was to encourage agriculture production and facilitate the distribution of farm produce from farmers to the final consumers. Over the years, particularly during the 90s and the early 2000s, the marketing board was the primary farm gate purchaser across the island. This is no longer the case. Massey stores, as well as other ad hoc farm produce purchasing, uh, as other ad hoc farm produce purchasing and distribution companies, coupled with direct interactions between hoteliers and farmers, has resulted in a diminished position of the marketing board. Currently, it handles approximately only 2% of the total produce of farmers. Consecutive years of losses have now rendered the board virtually obsolete, although its liabilities continue to burden taxpayers. The liabilities in 2014 were in excess of $2 million. The farmers are also dissatisfied with the board, highlighting low and non-guaranteed prices, arbitrary grading standards, and unreliable pickup services as just a few of the many complaints. Madam Speaker, the Solution Marketing Board cannot be allowed to continue down this path, and a determination must be made on its future. Through the years, several reports have been prepared making recommendations from closure of the board to restructuring of the shareholdings to full privatization. We've decided to solve this issue by winding up the operations of the board within the upcoming financial year. The St. Lucia Fish Marketing Corporation. Madam Speaker, the St. Lucia Fish Marketing Corporation is another institution which has registered disappointing performances within recent years and whose financial and operational performances leaves much to be desired. It was established in 1984 and with the goal of aiding in the development of the sector by providing a guaranteed market for fish foker. At the time, large volumes of fish were landed in St. Lucia, which oversaturated the market and resulted in fishermen having to take up the role of supplier, vendor as well, thereby reducing their productive time. Several competitors have now entered the market and stand ready to accept fish which has landed on the island. This current situation now calls into question the role of the St. Lucia Fish and Marketing Corporation. Given that the competitors now are performing the role of the corporation and are doing so more efficiently. Madam Speaker, the Fish Marketing Corporation has also been heavily criticized by the same fishermen whom the corporation has established to assist. One common complaint, you guess it, late payments. In addition, the corporation has accumulated a significant debt over the years. In 2015, government borrowed $1.5 million to assist the corporation to meet its obligations and has been added to the debt stock by the country. Over $5 million now owed to the government from advances which have now been made to the corporation. It should be noted that this sum does not include the amounts borrowed by the government on the corporation's behalf. Madam Speaker, repayment of this amount will certainly be a struggle for the corporation, which has consistently underperformed and government will have to make an imminent decision on its future. Madam Speaker, Radio St. Lucia has been in the news. It's another state-affiliated entity which appears to have lost its way. The financial performance of Radio St. Lucia in recent years has been far from desirable, and it continues to accumulate liabilities which would possibly be inherited by, which could possibly be inherited by government. As of March 31st, 2015, <coughs> the company's accumulated losses amounted to 3,362,725 dollars. And the company has also reported a loss of $515,497 in 2015. The company has also failed to meet its statutory requirements, by the way, of wage-related expenses. Radio St. Lucia owes the National Insurance Corporation $543,000 for unpaid employee contributions and owes government $231,000 in unpaid taxes. This is in addition to a significant accounts payable balance and contingent liabilities. Madam Speaker, the annual government subvention of 417000 is unable to meet the significant liabilities which are being accumulated by Radio St. Lucia. Like the Marketing Board and the Fish Marketing Corporation, the factual matrix upon which our Radio St. Lucia was established has changed. When Radio St. Lucia was established, there were few avenues for disseminating information to our citizens. The radio was the most widely used tool for mass media, 
and there were very few other radio stations. Madam Speaker, the current climate is far different. The internet, television, cell phones have taken over in terms of communication. The airwaves are saturated with radio stations, and multiple avenues exist for the government to get its message across to, the, to its citizens. We must therefore revisit the question of the role of Radio Solution in this current climate. Madam Speaker, my government will recognize, will reorganize the GIS to more effectively disseminate government information and its programming. The company currently known as Radio St. Lucia will be closed and the relevant programs will be restructured to take advantage of the new technologies for the information and dissemination. Madam Speaker, we propose to review the operations of the government supply warehouse. Supply warehouse is the sole distributor of bulk rice, flour, sugar on the island. The supply warehouse also facilitates special requests for the import of flour and sugar and performs quality checks on these commodities. The department first for some time has operated a loss with expenditures suppressing revenue collections. The government will make a determination on the way forward for the supply warehouse after the review has been completed. The St. Lucia National Trust is charged with conserving the natural and cultural heritage of St. Lucia. It is an advocacy group and is also responsible for developing the sites which have been vested in it. As an advocacy group, the trust performs that function reasonably well. The trust has, however, not performed well in developing the sites that are vested in it. The government has supported the trust through annual subventions, as well as through the vesting of the trust premier heritage sites. These valuable national assets can and should be leveraged to generate more revenue to sustain its operations. And thereby, the trust is being to generate significant revenue to sustain its, 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 its operations. And thereby, the trust is being asked to revise its business model to become financially independent. As a result, the annual subvention will be discontinued. However, the government will continue to provide support to the initiatives the government believes has merit in the support of the development objectives of the state. As by way of an example, Madam Speaker, the trust recently submitted a proposal which was approved by the former government. The proposal calls for the current museum to be made into a conference facility and one of the buildings to be converted into an office. A feasibility study was conducted in 2014, Madam Speaker by a well-known accounting firm here in St. Lucia. In 2014, Harbor Club and, and, and Royalton had not been announced. In that study, it indicated that the proposal of the trust was cash negative. It could not sustain itself and indicated that the trust ought to find financing by selling land or by getting a government subsidy, or both. The question that we asked is the government, what would those projects do to improve the patrimony of St. Lucia? Why would the trust involve itself in projects that are cash flow negative? We also indicated to the trust that they have no example of one project, or one site that is financially viable. And we've indicated to them that this must change. And we're asking for them to look into themselves to see how they're going to change that. Madam Speaker, much has been said about the NICE program. NICE was introduced in 2012 as a national response to the growing problem of unemployment in St. Lucia. The objective of this initiative was to provide short-term employment and to, unemployed, to the unemployed with a view to making them more marketable, thus increasing their chances of earning future income by way of the experience gained during short-term employment and acquired skills and training. The project had a three-year lifespan from 2012 to 2015, and the government committed to investing the sum of EC $100 million over a three-year period, some of which was borrowed funds. The three components were the Constituency Projects and Infrastructure Works Program, CPIP, which ended within one year, and we spent over $7 million on that component. The Small Business Targeted Assistance Program, 
which also lasted a little over a year, and some, as of, as of, some aspects of it was transferred to the NAP. The National Apprenticeship Placement Program was the only surviving component of the NICE project, where over 1,100 people were placed within various government agencies. It was noted in many instances persons were sent to various government departments that didn't request additional help. It appeared to be more a case of placing the individual somewhere rather than a departmental needs. In dialogue with some of the agencies, the general consensus was the lack of consultation prior to the placements being sent. Most of the agencies were not given the opportunity to decide their major area of need and to make requests based on those needs. Whilst the intention of the program was to have placements for a period of six months, most of the persons under the program had been employed within the program from the lifespan of the placement program, some as many as three to four years. This created a level of expectancy and dependency on both the part of the agency and the placements, as well as not part of the original mandate of the program. Madam Speaker, NICE became a job, not a skills enhancement project, and in some instances, the NICE workers were earning more than a permanent staff. And so, Madam Speaker, my government has decided to review the NICE program, and as a result of it, will keep the home health care program in its entirety and will reintroduce the National Apprentice Program. Madam Speaker, the St. Lucia Postal Service has served us well. It predicates independence and has connected individuals, businesses, and families both locally and abroad. Traditionally, however, the operations of the Postal Service have been running at a loss. With the advent of the internet and email, the demand for postal services has declined and significantly resulting in a reduction in the revenue from these traditional services. This cannot continue. Madam Speaker, particularly given our recent fiscal constraints and our effort to increase the efficiency of the public service, we must reassess the role of the post Postal Service. We will therefore consider, consider privatization. This is not a decision we will take lightly, but one which we must consider given the requirements of the times and our dire fiscal situation. Privatization will accomplish two things. It will force the organization to review its operations and become more efficient and the value of services will face market forces and be priced accordingly. Madam Speaker, none of these decisions will be easy to make, nor do we make them lightly. But these tough decisions are necessary if we are to begin to turn our economy around. Subventions and grants to state-affiliated agencies should not be a black hole in which money is poured but rather should be viewed as investments which should produce returns of relevant quality services to the people of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, during the fiscal year of 2017-2018, the government intends to spend a total of 1.513 billion, representing a 6.1% <coughs> increase over the 2016-2017 approved estimates and a 14% increase over the preliminary outturn. Thank you. And a 14% increase over the preliminary outturn for the preceding year. Of the total amount budgeted for in the fiscal year 2017-2018, recurrent expenditure accounts for 76.1%, an amount of 1.15 billion is allocated while the amount allocated for capital expenditure is 362 million representing a 23.9% of total expenditure. The budget amount for the recurrent expenditure includes 124 million for debt principal repayments. The budget will be financed as follows. Recurrent revenue of 1 billion 73 billion 1.073 billion comprising tax revenues of 958 million Ta non-tax revenue of 115 million, capital revenue from the proceeds of sale of assets amounting to 7.4 million, grants amounting to 87.4 million from family governments and multiple multilateral institutions, including the Republic of China of Taiwan, contributing 35.7 million, Caribbean Development Bank, contributing 9.9 .9 million, and European Development Bank, contributing 13.8 million. The Government of Mexico, 
contributing 9.1 million, and the World Bank contributing a total of 9.8 million. United Nations Environmental Program, 4.2 million. Government instru in instruments, including bonds of 208 million and treasury bills of 50 million. Other loans totaling 84.8 million, comprising 43.1 billion from the Caribbean Development Bank, 24.9 million from the World Bank, 13.6 million from the Republic of China, Taiwan, 1 million from the National Insurance Corporation, and 2.2 million from the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development. Madam Speaker, I wish at this time to provide a brief summary of the allocation of expenditure. You may recall that a number of agencies of government were reconfigured into clusters, so a comparison to the previous year may be somewhat difficult. The economic sector departments are poised to receive the largest share of total expenditure in the amount of $899 million. This represents an increase of $87.2 million, or 10%, over the last financial year. Of this amount, some $612 million, or 69%, is allocated to recurrent expenditure, while $286 million, or 31%, represents the share allocated from capital expenditure. The Ministry of Finance will receive the largest share of this amount, totaling $499 million, or 56% of the total expenditure, for the economic sector. It is extremely important to note, Madam Speaker, that approximately $376 million, or 76% of budgeted for the debt services, is budgeted for the debt service payments and retiring benefits. $376 million. Madam Speaker, I promise to allocate the Department of to promise to allocate to the Department of Economic Development, Transport and Civilization the sum of $67.8 million for capital expenditure, of which $27.5 million is to be allocated to the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. The objective of this project is to reduce vulnerability to natural disasters and climate change. I'm also proposing an allocation of $19.1 million for the St. Jude's Hospital Reconstruction Project and $19.2 million for the Constituency Development Program. Madam Speaker, I've discussed the poor condition of our road network. In this regard, I propose to allocate to the Ministry of Infrastructure, Ports and Energy the sum of $60.8 million for capital expenditure, out of which $14.9 million is for the Disaster Recovery Program. This program is intended to address the impact of Hurricane Tomas and reduce the risk and associated with landslide and flood hazards. The balance of capital investment in the amount of $42.8 million will go towards road improvement and rehabilitation works throughout the country. Madam Speaker, our government intends to resurrect, revitalize, and reinvigorate, reinvigorate the agricultural sector. And I wish to propose a major capital injection of $49.1 million to help stimulate that sector. Of this amount, $13 million is proposed to go towards the Banana Productivity Improvement Project, $10.9 million to the Agricultural Transformation Program, and $3.9 million to the rehabilitation of farms following tropical um, Tropical Storm Matthew. In respect to our water supply system, I'm extremely pleased to announce an allocation of $10.6 million and $5.9 million for the Denry and View Fort water supply redevelopment projects, respectively. Madam Speaker, I wish to propose a capital of $33.6 million to the Department of Tourism, Information and Broadcasting. On this amount, $28.9 million will go towards tourism marketing promotion to support tourism marketing and airlift into this country. Madam Speaker, in respect to the Department of Housing, Urban Renewal and Telecommunications, I propose to allocate $24.5 million, the bulk of which will be directed to Proud Settlement Upgrade Project, Proud 3, the National Sites and Services Program, and the CDB Funded Housing Construction Program. Madam Speaker, I now turn to the social services sector. An allocation of $406.7 million is, is, is proposed for the sector, of which $359 million is recurrent expenditure, and $47 million is for capital expenditure. This represents an increase in allocation of a mil $11 million over last year's budget. It is no surprise, Madam Speaker, that the bulk of the recurrent expenditure, a sum of $289 million, is earmarked for, ministers of education, for the Ministries of Education and Health, and the remainder of $69 million is to the distributed is to be distributed to the ministries of equity, labor, youth development, and local government. As it relates to capital expenditure, a sum of 
22.6 million is proposed for the Ministry of Equity, of which the provision of 10.7 million is for the Basic Needs Trust Fund, seventh and eighth program. A further 5.3 million is for the Home Care Program and 3.2 million to the Youth Empowerment and Life Project. Further, Madam Speaker, a capital provision of 18.7 million is allocated for the Ministry of Health and Wellness. A sum of 6.6 .6 million and 4.7 million is earmarked for the commissioning of a new hospital and new national hospital works program, respectively. Madam Speaker, I now wish to focus on the justice system, which has been badly <coughs> neglected. We'll address the issues plaguing it. An amount of 139 million is to be allocated to this sector, of which 132 million is for recurrent expenditure and 7.6 million for capital expenditure. In the area of capital expenditure, 3.8 million is to be allocated to the fire service department, particularly for the firefighting equipment and to effect repairs to the fire stations. I wish to announce that we will be commissioning the Babineau Fire Station. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the police are in desperate need of vehicles, many of which are in poor condition. In this regard, I am pleased to allocate an amount of 772,000 for purchasing vehicles. With respect to the general service agencies, Madam Speaker, I propose an allocation of 58.5 million. Of this amount, 38.1 million is recurrent expenditure and 20.4 million is capital expenditure. The share of this amount is as follows. Ministry of Public Service, 27.5 million, and the Office of the Prime Minister, 8.7 million. Madam Speaker, I wish to make mention of a $10 million allocation to the National Apprenticeship Program, which includes two components, namely a call center and hospitality tra training. A provision of $5.9 million is allocated for, for, al allocated for the Caribbean Regional Communication Infrastructure, CARSIP, for the rollout of the government-wide area network. Finally, Madam Speaker, I wish to propose an allocation of $8.9 million to the agencies of governance, which include legislator, the service commissions, and the electoral and audit departments. Madam Speaker, I wish to reiterate that our government, through this budget, has demonstrated its unwavering commitment to grow this economy by investing more in its capital program, which reflects an increase of 36.2 million, or 11% from last year. Madam Speaker, the people of St. Lucia elected the United Workers' Party on June 6, 2016, to bring back confidence and prosperity to our country. This budget puts, on to the road, puts us onto the road of economic recovery. Our government believes that we must pursue an aggressive pro-growth strategy led by a competitive private sector, which is ably supported by a responsive, efficient, and effective public service. This current cycle we find ourselves of low growth, increased deficit, has crippled the government's ability to provide basic services such as globally competitive education, security for our people, road infrastructure, and basic social services. If we make no changes, the quality will continue to decline. It is our firm conviction that our strategy will deliver higher levels of growth and a greater levels of investment, more sustainable jobs, and efficient management of our resources, which can lead to surplus government to provide a higher standard of living for the people of St. Lucia. It is important that we understand that in order to achieve a higher standard of living for the people, we need to generate consistent government savings. Madam Speaker, one of the challenges that I foresee in pursuing our policy agenda is implementation. It is no secret that we have suffered from a serious implementation deficit in the past that has seriously affected our ability to implement projects in a timely and a cost-efficient manager. My government's mantra, Madam Speaker, is execute, execute, execute. We intend to put in place the institutional framework and the strengthening capacity to enable us to accelerate the pace of implementation. The transformation program that, we'll put in place, that we will put in place will require bold, courageous, and decisive leadership. Our government shall provide this leadership, Madam Speaker. My cabinet of ministers and I intend to be the champions of our reform and our change agenda. 
Madam Speaker, I have witnessed firsthand the depth of despair and hopelessness that many families are experiencing in St. Lucia. It is for this reason our government felt that there was need to provide immediate relief to St. Lucians by the way of the reductions in the value added tax from 15% to 12.5%. We wish to pursue with urgency, Madam Speaker, the implementation of a social safety net system for the lower income group in our society. We are a caring and empathetic government that will address the plight of the less fortunate in our society. Madam Speaker, this budget is part of a four-year plan that will reform, transform, and modernize our St. Lucia. This budget will therefore provide the foundation for the future growth and development of our country. And so our government has chosen the path of change. We are, forced on, we are focused on building a new St. Lucia with citizens, who are, with, with citizens who are proud and committed to excellence, who are accepting of all people, thoughts and ideas. We relish the challenge of creating a society that is competitive, productive, and inclusive with opportunities for all. I wish to thank everyone who provided support to the budget process, including all the stakeholders, including all the stakeholders who have shared their ideas and provided significant input in the budget process. I would also like to thank all the agencies for their valuable contribution, in particular, the staff of the Department of the Finance for putting together all of the budget documents. And with that, Madam Speaker, I beg to move. Honorable members, the question is that the appropriation 2017-2018 bill be read a second time. Honorable, Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, Public Service, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I move that this House stand adjourned until um, tomorrow, Wednesday the 9th, May 2017, at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Wednesday 10th. My apology, Madam Speaker, Wednesday the 10th. Honorable members, the question is that the House do stand adjourned until Wednesday, May 10th, at 4 p.m. I now put the question. As many are as of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. This house to stand adjourned. All right. And this concludes today's House of Assembly sitting. It is the 9th of May, 2017, and I am Alicia Ali from the Government Information Service. The Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Alan M. Chastney, has laid his first appropriations bill before the House of Assembly since being elected into office on the 6th of June, 2017. He covered a number of areas, a number of categories, and as you can tell, it is a very large-scale project that he is intending to undertake over the next four years. As the Prime Minister said, uh, this is just not a one-year plan. He has outlined the development of St. Lucia up until 2021. 20, now, let's just go through some of the categories first. Uh, he discussed a national apprenticeship program uh, for this fiscal year. Uh, the government intends to train 500 people for employment on the cruise line. And also, St. Lucia will be partnering with an artificial intelligence training lab and uh, 50 jobs are expected to be created immediately. In terms of national food security, the Prime Minister intends, uh, his government intends to revitalize the banana industry.
industry and increase production through the Banana Productivity Improvement Project. And it is estimated that in year three of the project, 60 to 70,000 pounds of bananas will be produced and it will be sustainable. He also spoke of greenhouse technology being used to reduce the seasonality of crops and to ensure a more sustainable demand and supply option between local farmers and hotels. Uh, the disaster risk reduction plan for agriculture is in place and will continue. In terms of social services, uh, the Prime Minister announced the development, or the, should I say the further development of the after school program. And he intends, through his government, to create linkages between culture to schools to sporting organization and thereby maximizing the use of school and community centers to keep our young people gainfully engaged. Education sector. There will be several studies carried out in the educational sector. The first will be a comprehensive assessment of all schools. Also a diagnostic study of the education system with the aim for transformation of the sector. Additionally, the Prime Minister announced that uh, his government will introduce and enforce standards throughout the education system. Uh, these standards will be um, more relevant to teachers and curriculum and syllabi delivery. And in a rapidly changing world, the Prime Minister is trying to ensure that our young people, our students, are prepared for a globally competitive environment. And he has proposed that the government of St. Lucia will be making digital content available in lieu of textbooks. The Ministry of Education is supposed to be working with teachers uh, to create that content and to adapt to the learning styles of our students. The Prime Minister also spoke about building capacity in renewable energy and it is through the renewable energy uh, portion of his, his contribution that he announced that uh, job creation will be spurred while broadening and diversifying the national economy and supporting efforts at protecting the environment and combating climate change. In terms of revenue measures, uh, the Prime Minister did announce an increase in the excise tax on gasoline and diesel by $2.50. That increase is earmarked to deal with road infrastructure and repair. Uh, the Prime Minister, in another portion of his contribution, pointed to the disappointing performances of some of our statutory bodies. Among those is the St. Lucia, Fish, uh, the St. Lucia Marketing Board, which the Prime Minister revealed will be closed during this fiscal year. The St. Lucia Fish Marketing Corporation also performed disappointingly, according to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister announced that Radio St. Lucia will be closed during just this fiscal year. The Government Supply Warehouse and the St. Lucia Postal Service is under review, or should I say will be reviewed during this fiscal year, uh, with the view to finding out what is the way forward uh, and what will be most efficient. The St. Lucia National Trust uh, is being asked to review its business model to be more financially independent. And with all the revelations that the Prime Minister made during this year's appropriations bill, we will continue tomorrow, Wednesday the 10th of May at 4 p.m., where other members of the House of Assembly, other elected members on both the government and opposition side, will then give their contributions on what the Prime Minister has said. So please, this is Alicia Ali, and I'm inviting you to stay tuned to the National Television Network.